further ado, I know uh, we don't have everyone's time for a long time, so I want to go ahead and get started. First, I say thank you, everyone, for joining today's Organizer Circle. Today's topic is centered around food sovereignty, local problems, local solutions. And so uh, this is the second session that we've done. First session, we had a wonderful conversation with resident leaders who uh, spoke about different things that they're doing in the community. I know Ms. Rita ended up letting us know that she has a very green thumb herself, uh, and also Ms. Sandra, and uh, a couple of other people as well. And so we have a, a lot of wonderful things and a lot of people who do things in the community. And with that, uh, what we wanted to do was continue to build, continue to organize resources, continue to leverage resources or bring people together who have similar skill sets. We have also noticed as we have uh, been working with different communities for different years that people have started and grown things like gardens, sometimes they get abandoned or uh, for different reasons, people might not be able to uh, put as much time into it as they historically have. And we are finding that many times the biggest things that happen in those situations are resources. So um, that's the thing that we brought up that's a, a concern, we talked about different grants from resident leader grassroots grants to different things that people can do, different resources that people can go to for help. And so um, many of our resident leaders and more, most specifically, Ms. Chavik introduced and talked about cooperative extensive glowingly um, on our last organizing circle. And so with her help, we were able to get Mr. Matthew Scoggins on. And so he's from Cooperative Extension, Cooperative Extensions, excuse me. I know we don't have much of your time, Matthew, but uh, I did want to give you a chance to first introduce yourself. Thank you for joining us. Let us know a little bit about you and Cooperative Extensions and how Cooperative Extensions helps the communities. Of course, thank you. I'm glad that you've heard good things. Um, so I'm the community garden coordinator here at Cooperative Extension. Um, for those of you who don't know, Cooperative Extension is like a partnership between NCA and T and NC State. Um, and our job is to kind of disseminate information from those two organizations out to the public to basically help anyone who wants to grow be able to grow. Um, we have a center here in Forsyth County. Uh, we're in, our address is 1450 Fairchild Road. We're over on Liberty Street over by the airport. Um, but we do programs all around the county. Like I was up at Tobaccoville last night. And, um, but as he, he just meant, Christopher just mentioned that we did a program with uh, helping Jerilyn Travlett get a community garden started back up. Um, there are over 90 community gardens around the county that I know of. There's definitely a few more out there that I don't know about. And if they don't know about us, please send them my way. I'm happy to try to connect them with resources and help them, anyone who wants to grow, be able to grow. Um, they vary from anything from, a lot of them are at schools, um, everywhere from Kimberly Park. Yes, that is the website, you are correct. Um, like Kimberly Park and Dix Latham to like the special children's school where we try to work more like a horticultural therapy basis for children with special needs. Um, we do a lot of like just basic community gardens that are aimed at donating to local food pantries and things like that. Our, we have like horticultural therapists and people who work with large scale growers as well, but a lot of them are aimed at more local growers, um, especially ones aimed at the community. We cover everybody, of course, out the county, but if you're outside the county, there are agents in every single county and the Cherokee Nation. So we are very available. We try to host a wide range of programs and are able to travel, what the chat say. Um, um, so what I distribute, um, I usually distribute seeds as handed out soil. Um, we connect people with compost and things like that. Um, sometimes transplants and seeds as available. Uh, I sold a bunch of garden hoses. So if you're a community garden and you need resources, you know, I'm happy to try to connect you with money. We usually get from grants and things like that and also connect you with grants for your individual garden. 
Yes, they are free if you're part of our system, if that makes sense. Um, these are the most we, you have to do is sign a partnership agreement. Um, it's real simple. You, know, you don't require anything on your, your hand, as long as it's community garden. I don't just hand it out to individuals or anything. It has to be for the community, if that makes sense, or it's like a school or something like that. Um, it's not for like individual programs. And my definition of a garden varies a lot. You know, I try to meet people where they are. Um, whether it be just like a small pollinator garden, some of our libraries and things have things like that, or a full scale row vegetable garden, like try to connect people with resources where I can. I hope that sums us up fairly well. We have natural resources agents you can call if you have like snakes or something in your backyard. Um, I don't know, we cover a lot of bases. We do 4-H programs. I think a lot of people know about that. Maybe it's youth and things. Uh, we do teaching out the Arboretum. Uh, I host regular mentors meetings. If anybody runs a community garden and wants to get connected to other community garden leaders, the next one is the 31st at 5.30. Uh, so this Friday up at Cross North uh, Schools for Children um, at their garden out there that they use to teach out of. And hopefully connect you with some lessons and things that you can use to teach out of your own garden. That's one of the big, that's the big thing we emphasize education here is at the end of the day, we're trying to get information to people so they can distribute it themselves. As well so i do everything but maintenance pretty much i'm not going to come water your garden but if you want me to come out and look at it and you know maybe help address a bug problem or just tell you where to put stuff if you want to set up a new garden make sure it's not you know, shaded or going to be a big mud hole or something you know try to make sure it's a safe site and can meet your needs if that makes sense yes sir thank you so much um so i was looking at your email so i um Okay, that makes sense now. So you're you're with NC State. Right. Um, so I have an email through them, but I also have a Forsyth County email. I get my, you know, Forsyth County pays for my position. I get my yes, pay for the county and things, but I have like a no pay position with the cooperative extension, which is through ANT and NC State. So they just gave me an NC State email. Yes, sir. Makes sense. Yeah, I didn't <clears throat> I didn't realize it was cooperative. Uh, it, cooperative extensions with, was was with those two schools yeah so that's what, i think they've been around like 1914 or something and then wow. you know, of course it was like segregated a program so you know nc state had a program and then a t had a program and then they merged them together so and now we work for both yes sir and thank you for all the work you do okay so yeah um became aware of the meeting at cross nor well not at cross nor i just was uh, made aware that there was a meeting for people who do gardens. And so we would love more information about that that we can uh, pass on to resident leaders to hopefully get them to um, yeah, be a part of that. We got different resident leaders on, many of them spoke historically about um, the, the, the gardens that they have in their communities or in their, uh, even that they do their own and the food they give away, um, et cetera. So uh, being connected with other gardeners, it's funny, that was something we mentioned. We talked about, uh, because we got a health disparities collaborative. And so uh, we, we play with the term food sovereignty uh, uh, collaborative last meeting. And so part of it is, we also know that things exist, resources already exist, people have already done things, people are already doing things. So to be in uh, conjunction with others who are also doing good work and learning as well is wonderful. Yes, sir, and thank you for that. Natural resources for, I, I heard the, uh, the snakes, so, we had a nice conversation yesterday in the office about being, I'm from Wilmington and Dustin is from uh, well, Anson County. And uh, yeah, we were, we were talking about growing up, going fishing, and then just doing stuff like having experiences where we ran into water moccasins. And so at my outside, we played in the woods, we did all of that, but I never liked snakes. And see a black snake with white on it. That always terrified me the most. And so 
Can you give us uh, verbally the name of some of those resources who will help remove wildlife? See, well, say our natural resources agent actually is about to retire. So her position is mm -hmm. gonna open up soon. Um, her name's Phyllis. She does like the beekeeping. We see anything weird her way, basically. Like there's a weird fungus growing in my pool or something, you know, send it to Phyllis. Maybe she can help them figure it out. And the big thing is if we don't know, we can reach out to our universities and figure it out for you. Like, so we have a lot of resources at our disposal that can hopefully navigate that system and get you what you need to know and hopefully help when we can. Yes, yeah, sir. So beekeeping. We have uh, um, Miss, Miss Phyllis, she's about to retire. All right, so we got to hit her up real fast. So we're so, going to continue the beekeeping and things in the meantime. Like they have a monthly meeting up here every first Saturday of the month. Yeah, absolutely. And so do they do like a, what's the, I think they're groundhogs. I think that's what that big thing is in the yard. Yeah, we, 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 we can help, <laughs> or at least okay. hopefully. Yes, and so um, I think you might have mentioned it, uh, but could could you also tell us again where is uh where where is the cooperative extensions located? And if a community member wants to, can we just come to the building? When's the best time to come? Uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you guys? And are you the person we need to know? Say, well, okay, so we're located, our address is 1450 Fairchild Road. We are right off of Liberty Street over by the airport. Um, mm -hmm. We're actually going to move in a couple of years up to Tobaccoville, I think, but we're still going to try to maintain a downtown office and things, especially for positions like mine that are more so aimed at, you know, supporting, you know, I think, gardens and public housing and things like that. So, um, but yeah, 1450 Fairchild Road, we're open from 8 to 5, Monday to Friday. Uh, we do some night and weekend events and things like that. But if you want to walk in, we are, our doors open. We have a wonderful resources here. And if we're not in the office, you can look on our website and find a specific agent for your specific problem. Or if not, you feel free to call me and I'll, if I can't figure it out, I'll transfer it to someone who can. Yes, sir. And we have a question in the chat for you, uh, Brisa. Does cooperative extension have any programs for community members focused on farming, learning to be a gardener if they aren't already, et cetera? <laughs> yes, so we have a few different programs. Um, right now, Urban Farm School is going on. So that's already kind of passed. You have to sign up for next year's. Um, I also am planning on doing something later this summer. We call the Community Garden Leadership Academy. Uh, uh, me and a professor from a and are gonna work together and hopefully it'd be like a, maybe one or two or three Saturdays in a row, we meet up here and kind of go out to gardens. And that's much more informal class, I would say, and much more aimed at the community garden mentors. We also have a, an extension master gardener class. They call extension master gardener volunteers. Um, and that's much more intensive and multi-week and um, they're a great base. And they sometimes teach classes around the community. Um, like Bob LaPere teaches a regular class out at the Kernersville Public Library um it's every second tuesday of the month so the next one's on the 11th out of the kernersville library that's he calls it gardening 101 so if you go out there it's kind of an open forum he answers questions and things like that that's a great like entry level answer questions but as always we're here to answer questions and help you out um i could put my contact information into the chat if you would like to know more about specifics um, I know the Ma Master Gardener class comes up in May. Master Gardener's class in May, but you probably, so for to be a Master Gardener or to go into that class, you probably already have to have a, I guess, experience or at least a working relationship with your organization. We, I think it's open to just, it's open to anyone. I think you do have to like buy the textbook and things. So there is a little bit of cost associated with it. But that's mm -hmm. kind of what the leader, my leadership academy that's going to be later in the summer will hopefully, you know, be for people not interested in such a long term intensive course. And I try to do my programs in like, like outside of traditional working hours when I can to people who still have jobs, you know. Absolutely. Wonderful. Okay. Master gardening class in May. Community gardening 
Leadership Academy. And right now you say you got an Urban Farming Academy, but that's has already started. Yeah, that's they're three weeks in, I think. And so um, when someone when when different people are done, I guess with let's say the Urban Farming uh, Academy, are we community members able to I guess connect with these people who have learned a little bit and I guess get them to help as well? Would they be ready by then to go into different communities to help out? As far as, so getting volunteers to help out with gardens, is that the question, I guess? Yes, would, would, and would the Urban Farming uh, Academy graduates be ready to help after, I guess, would they be good resources to help after that? Or I assume so. I don't really work with them that much, if that makes sense. Um, yes, sir, I got you. But I do know they have helped out in the past at a few different places, but, you know, to getting them to volunteer if they're like working um say a, yeah like a for-profit farm here in the yes. states you know finding the time for them to do that we don't really pair them usually mm -hmm. um but like i said either me or master gardener can come out and give advice and then i do have like a volunteer intake form if that makes sense and i try to pair them with gardens they, they usually give me like a like a zip code and i try to pair them with all the gardens i, I like give them a list of gardens i know in that zip code and try to pair them there so we were getting like local people meeting local needs if that makes sense yes yeah, sir sounds sounds about what we're looking at local problems local solutions local people meeting local needs sounds wonderful uh and I, i'm gonna stop bogging you down with questions but we do have one more in the chat and if anybody in the community has any commission any other questions please feel free to ask this next one and i'm pretty sure you can read it but i'm gonna say it out loud for uh the Facebook group. Are there any community gardens you work with that have successfully grown a substantial amount of food for their neighborhood? It would be great to have a few of them and build more considering the increased food prices and the reduced SNAP benefits. Yeah, so one of the things we talked about is how SNAP is uh, ending the extended benefits program. I believe it will be May 11th. And so I think part of this is how do we help the uh, community to counter or prepare for this properly? For sure. It is certainly a difficult issue. Um, so I guess it depends on what you mean by substantial. Like any little bit is going to help. Um, but there are some of the larger ones that have like a lot of beds. Um, like Catholic Charities donates a lot. They have like a few dozen beds downtown. And then the big one I can think of is they call it the food bank garden. That's actually out across Nora where we'll be going. It kind of like further back from the teaching garden. They have like a giant row crops. They donate out the second harvest. Um, but I don't know, most of them are working with small plots of land. You know, Winston land is, land is hard to find, officially open. A lot of them are kind of, you know, in the back of schools or alleyways and things like that. People are, get creative and produce a lot more than you think they would out of a small plot. So some people just go around and hang them on people's doorknobs. Like they get tomatoes in, they go out and hand them out wherever they can. Um, people are generally very generous when it comes to these gardens, but I said it varies a lot. Um, and some of them, like the ones more aimed at education and things, sometimes I send them home with backpack programs. I know that's been very popular at a lot of schools. Um, so SNAP benefits and things like that go. I know some of the farmer's markets, it takes SNAP benefits, but you know, people getting to the farmer's market is an issue trying to ride public transit and things like that so certainly we there's always room for improvement for sure yes sir thank you for that matthew um anyone else have a question that you want to ask matthew i think we got uh miss diane is that you i don't know who I iPhone is it could be misfits or uh hi I'm here yes ma'am absolutely but I know we don't got a lot of your time uh and so just to uh give you guys Miss Diane is one of our resident leaders from Boston Durham community they have gardens and they also house the Hope uh community 
and food center, not community center. And so Miss uh, Angela is also a volunteer with Hope. Miss Diane, in addition to being a resident leader, is on the board for Hope. So I wanted her to, I guess, talk to us for a minute, give us some of her time, and help us understand what Hope is doing. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, and, and thank you for giving me time to talk about HOPE, um, which is a great program that's been in the community now for over 10 years. I don't know the exact number of years, but HOPE is an acronym for Helping Our People Eat. Uh, this nonprofit was started by a, uh, a doctor, a pediatrician, and her husband because they saw that the need in the community regarding uh, children in particular uh, was on the weekend where the children were getting food during the, the school week, uh, you know, through the various programs offered in the school, but on the weekend was where uh, there, there was a lack or a need. And so what HOPE does uh, it goes out to communities uh, Saturday and on Sunday uh, and delivers bags, brown bags of lunches for the children. There's, there's a sandwich in there. There's usually a piece of fruit. Uh, there's uh, a sweet. Um, they, and everything is done uh, nutritionally. So, you know, the idea is to uh, give the children a meal that is healthy, not full of sugars and salt. Um, on Saturday morning at Hope, and, and the Hope headquarters is located on uh, Northwest Crawford, uh, right across from uh, St. John uh, C CME Church. Uh, on Saturday morning, volunteers come of all ages and help to prepare uh, those lunch bags. Um, so it looks like an assembly line. You know, somebody has the bread, somebody has the meat, somebody has the cheese <laughs> and so forth and so on. Uh, somebody puts the sandwich in the bag, you know, somebody puts the, the bag sandwich in the bag with the fruit and so forth and so on. Um, our numbers have uh, pretty much been steady, uh, but, actually the number is growing. We're now serving close to 1,100 uh, children uh, every weekend. And so the Hope Van reminds me of an old fashioned ice cream truck. Uh, we pull up into a community and we play music uh, to let uh, the families know that we're there. Um, we open up the van door and uh, uh, whomsoever. Uh, and as children, but we also provide a bag of fresh produce to the adults that uh, come along from the community. Um, and again, it's, it's whomsoever. We, we don't ask for any information from them. They don't have to sign anything. Um, all they have to do is just, you know, get in line and come to the van. Uh, the children are given either water or milk uh, to drink. Uh, it's their preference. Um, when, when you volunteer with HOPE, uh, the assignment can either be Saturday morning helping with the assembling uh, of those uh, uh, packages, those lunches, uh, or Saturday morning going out to the communities and the communities that are being served on Saturday morning are communities uh, within the Boston Thurman uh, community. We have uh, several large um, um, communities um, in, in, Boston, in Boston Thurman. And so they're served on uh, Saturday. On Sunday um, afternoon from around 12 to four, that's when the vans go out all across uh, the city, all across Winston-Salem, east side, west side, south side, um, all, all over. And uh, those are multiple vans that go out. Uh, we ask for volunteers to either be drivers on the van or to be, you know, helpers. 
uh, with the uh, distribution on the van. So that hope has an always, there is a need for hope volunteers. And uh, so, and we welcome families, we welcome church groups, we work, welcome youth groups, senior groups. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you, if you have a, a heart to, uh, to see that children uh, get food, then um, we have a place for you. Uh, Hope also has been in the news recently because we're located right next door to the hydroponics uh, center. Now, hydroponics is uh, uh, the technology by which food can be grown uh, with water uh, or very limited soil. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to, to uh, tour the hydroponics center, uh, you might want to uh, contact Hope because we recently were awarded a contract by the city to now uh, manage the hydroponic um, center. We've had a relationship with the hydroponic center uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, the primary relationship has been uh, at Hope, we have refrigerated um, freezers, those big walk-in freezers. And so as they've grown products uh, at the hydroponic center and uh, they needed to be able to store them, you know, in, in a cool place, they have used uh, some of the space in our uh, refrigeration, um, uh, walk-in refrigerators. So this is a, a good uh, uh, marriage merge of two programs that are committed to uh, feeding uh, the community. Also at the HOPE uh, office uh, on Northwest Crawford, every Tuesday we have a neighborhood market uh, which is open to anyone and everyone. Uh, it's a market in which you can come and buy fresh produce, fruits, vegetables, um, depending upon what's in season. Uh, everything from grapes, apples, oranges, um, celery, squash, uh, lettuce, tomatoes. And it's at a fraction of the cost of what you would pay retail. And when I say fraction, I mean a fraction of the cost. Uh, you can also use your uh, WIC um, or if we, we give out, um, we have sponsors who actually sponsor uh, Hope being able to give out coupons uh, for free uh, food through the neighborhood market. And so uh, folks uh, can come and get like a $20 coupon and, and buy up as much as they want with that $20 coupon. Uh, at the market, you can use uh, your... your um, you know, like your, your credit card, debit card, uh, your WIC card, whatever, EBT, that's right, EBT, uh, you can use all of those at the market. And that's from 4.30 to 6. And please, I might have those hours wrong. So just to be sure, go to the uh, hope.org uh, uh, online and you, you'll get uh, all the information about all the services that HOPE offers, uh, in particular, the, uh, the various programs uh, that we run. Now, when I say programs, I'm talking about fundraisers because you, you can't do this kind of, uh, offer this kind of service to the community without doing uh, a continuous fundraising uh, project. Uh, we're real excited because our next uh, fundraiser coming up is um, titled Be a Kid, Feed a Kid event at ROAR, R-O-A-R. -R. That's the, uh, that uh, resident, I mean resident, that restaurant center uh, right there off of, uh, I think it's Liberty. Uh, and if you haven't been there, treat yourself. Awesome. Uh, the idea, though, is that you'll you'll come down to Roar, um, and in addition to you know there being food and 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 uh, drinks as such, but you get to play because Roar you know offers uh, I think there's a bowling alley there's a lot of recreational uh, things that go on uh, inside. Um, uh, it says golf, bowling, live music. 
uh, all the atmosphere. Uh, it really is. This has been a, a very positive event. It's scheduled this year for May 4th. This is the sixth year and it grows bigger with every year. Uh, and just like it says, be a kid, feed a kid. So by purchasing tickets, uh, that gives you entrance and you can come in and have a, a really good time and know that your monies are helping to, um, you know, help the children in, in our community. We do have um, here in the Boston Thurman community, uh, we have community gardens. And uh, if Mary uh, is on the line, um, I'd rather her talk about the community gardens because uh, she oversees that through the Boston Thurman uh, Community Engagement Roundtable um, uh, Health and Wellness Program. So Mary, are you online? No, I, don't, I don't think she's with us. Uh, let me check. Okay, all right. Yes, but I, I will say um, <laughs> I was riding through the Boston Thurman community a few weeks ago, taking my Mm -hmm. my daughters and nieces to the park and so right. uh, miss mary it was on a saturday or sunday she was out in the garden working so i seen her oh, yeah. and i spoke to her yeah. and i didn't even know the, uh, mm -hmm. go, ahead. Mm -hmm. now, go ahead well so so the gardens that we have community gardens that we have uh in uh boston thurman uh th they're there really are three. One is located at uh, Hope uh, in the, um, on the side and the back of the property at Hope on Northwest Crawford. And so that's one of the uh, volunteer assignments uh, that, that we have available uh, for those that want to help Hope. But uh, the other two, um, across from Kimberly Park Elementary School, is the Kimberly Kids uh, Garden. Now this garden is under the direction of Rosa Johnson, who is a master gardener. She went through that uh, cooperative program uh, to get her training and her certification as a master gardener. And she's been um, uh, growing that garden um, for the last five years, I think it is. In that garden, that the Kimberly Park garden, you have, oh gracious, I'm going to say at least 20, 20 to 25 beds um, for growing. Now, anyone in the community can come and ask for one of the beds and, and then take charge, you know, do the planting, do the weeding, do the watering and the harvesting. Uh, she also has, I think, four or five of the raised garden uh, beds, so that uh, if if you know bending down is is difficult, you would do better standing up. She has those available there as well. Uh, in addition to uh, fruits, vegetables, um, there are beds of herbs, all kinds of herbs. Um, as a master gardener, Rosa uh, knows all. The, she knows a whole lot about, you know, uh, plants and, and the medicinal uh, health, uh, healthy um, um, relationship uh, that, that you can have with plants, and she'll give you instructions. Now, that garden actually operates uh, throughout the year because she is also um, bought into the school, Kimberly Park. Uh, so during the winter months, she goes into the classrooms and of the, uh, I think they're third and fourth graders and does demonstrations with them in relationship to uh, gardening, uh, in relationship to, you know, plants, uh, all types of uh, just, you know, <laughs> these are things that we learned in school uh, when we took uh, the, was was physical living or, or something living classes, biology classes. Well, Rosa goes into the classroom and does that. Now, now that the weather though has gotten good, the children will start coming to her in the garden, and 
under her direction with their teachers, the children are taught how to plant. Uh, they're taught how to uh, weed. They're taught about composting. Um, they're taught about, um, you know, in, in, in other words, what they're, they're, they're giving uh, the children uh, from Kimberly Park uh, Elementary School a hands-on experience with gardening and, and what that means. Um, so that, that garden runs, like I said, you know, uh, during the summer months, um, she runs the garden and she has more community folks, but there are a number of uh, agencies uh, that uh, will send uh, volunteers to help with uh, maintaining the garden. Um, Love Out Loud is one of the agencies that, um, you know, solicits volunteers. And uh, Miss Rosa can say, well, I, I know she said she wanted um, um, a, a shelter built and and they came out and built the shelter. It's, it's really, I mean, a walk-in shelter where she has tables set up uh, where, you know, she does like her starter pots and whatnot. Um, uh, she has folks who come from all over the city, both as individuals and as groups who come in to uh, help with uh, maintaining the garden. Uh, the cooperative came in and they put in a whole irrigation system uh, for that garden. Uh, uh, the, the city set it up so that uh, that garden has its own separate water supply. Um, so it, it really is exciting, uh, particularly if, if you're interested in starting a community garden and what that project can look like and how you can grow it, I would, I would encourage you to reach out to uh, Rosa Johnson. Um, the other garden, community garden that we have uh, is one in Neil's place. Now this garden um, was uh, set up for the residents who live in Neil's place, which is off of uh, University Parkway uh, and 13th Street, sitting between Thurman and University Parkway off of, off of 13th. Um, that is a smaller garden, but it's, it's a garden that, that, that grows big. Um, I know for myself, I love it when they grow collard greens uh, at that garden. I mean, some of them are, you know, they're huge. Who knew God, collard greens grew that big? But they're wonderful. I mean, they they grow everything, uh, fruits, not so much fruit. I think they do more vegetables in that garden. Um, uh, but uh, Mary uh, and her team, uh, the health and wellness team, uh, has uh, been um, requesting a separate water source for that garden. And I believe working with uh, 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 the council uh, member, Mayor Pro Tem, and um, other um, agencies in the city, uh, I think that is about, if it's not installed, it's about to be installed where they will have their own separate uh, water source uh, for that garden. Uh, but that garden is more a garden of uh, residents. Yes, sir. Uh, and, uh, you know, folks who you see in that garden, you don't see a master gardener like at the Kimberly Kids Garden. Uh, mm -hmm. What you see there are just, you know, folks who are interested in, in having, um, you know, uh, uh, a bed and, and do some gardening. Um, but, uh, but they've been very active uh, for a number of years. And hopefully at some point when Mary uh, is able to get on the line, uh, she can talk more about uh, that garden and yes, some other things that the health and wellness uh, team is doing. Yes, um, Are well, there any questions? Yeah, uh, firstly, thank you, Ms. Uh, Fitzhugh. You gave us a wealth of information. I did have two questions. Uh, and so um, given the conversation, food sovereignty, I want to just help everyone, uh, the audience, basically understand gardening is essential when we talk about food sovereignty because gardening is the basis of people learning how to grow their own food. And so just putting the... Uh, conversation and perspective. One of the questions, and, and with that, Ms. Fitzhugh, one of the biggest questions I had uh, 
I remember you gave us a tour of the community and the Hope uh, facility in general. And one of my favorite things that I saw was the food classes. And so um, I was wondering if if you could tell us, firstly, because one of the things we, we spoke about last time was how different people might have produce, but they might not necessarily a, it's not ready to be made, et cetera. So can you tell us a little bit about the food program, how that came about and what it does? Well, um, when Hope, well, so let me let me go back a bit because as resident leaders, I think you'll find this interesting. Um, Hope as a nonprofit uh, wanted to uh, establish their own headquarters and their own warehouses. And so they came to the Boston Thurman Neighborhood Association uh, with this project in mind to to, uh, set up uh, their their headquarters, their location in the Boston Thurman community. And one of the reasons that they looked at us was because we're smack dab in a food desert. And they said, you know, we can, we'll be able to uh, hopefully uh, provide uh, a resource to the community like the neighborhood market uh, where people can come and buy, you know, fresh uh, fruit, vegetables, produce. They also said to us that they wanted to offer uh, cooking classes because one of the, through, through the various surveys and Mary and I did uh, a survey with uh, Wake Forest a big survey with Wake Forest where um, we canvassed the entire community asking people questions about um, their their lifestyle as it related to their eating habits as families and and individuals. And um, one of the things that came out of those surveys that were done was the fact that some folks really, you know, they're interested in eating fresh vegetables, um, fruit, but they don't know how to cook those items. And so Hope said, we will offer those classes here. And uh, they've been doing that now for a couple of years. And in fact, it it keeps growing because now one of the uh, cooking classes that's become very popular uh, is the um, me and grandma cooking class where uh, uh, the, the, the grandparents are coming to these classes uh, with their children. And those cooking classes, they're free. And um, uh, all of the, uh, the product is uh, supplies that's necessary for the class is, is there and, and given to them. In fact, after they take the class, whatever they produce, they can take home. Um, and the classes are conducted by professional chefs. Uh, from the various restaurants around uh, um, uh, the city. And they come in and uh, we have uh, ranges that um, um, we had one of the uh, uh, sponsors. I think we have eight of them now. Uh, these are uh, what I, I would call stovetop um, ranges where they have the burners, multiple burners on them. And um so they set up a station where you have, you know, your stove there, you've got your, your pots, plans, whatever utensils you need, you have whatever product you need, and you're taking a, a hands-on cooking class. At the end of the session, um, through uh, various sponsorships, there's usually a wonderful giveaway. I mean, they've given them uh, these like the hot hot pots that are very popular now, the pressure cookers, um, uh, whole you, you cooking sets. Um, <laughs> I, I got to tell you, the joke is, you know, it's like, uh, uh, can I take the class? <laughs> you know, can I sign up? Uh, <laughs> just to get those, those wonderful products that they're giving out. But uh, uh, the classes have been very popular um, and they are open uh, to the community at large. So 
obviously we we try to you know encourage folks from Boston Thurman, but you're not limited. If if you're someone on the east side, you're interested, then you sign up, and and hopefully there. Needless to say, there are limited uh, slots available, so you may have to wait for a session, but um, you certainly are welcome to do that. And the fact that they want you to bring, uh, if at all possible, a child with you supports, uh, you know, the mission of hope to, uh, for, in yes, terms of feeding children. Yes, ma'am. Let's see, what so, else is hope doing? How, uh, with yeah. that, uh, how do we, how do we get community members signed up to the cooking classes? So I think that's a wonderful well, idea. The, the thing to do is to go on to the website, mm -hmm. uh, to go and to the uh, Hope to the website, website. Yes, okay, right. and um, look at um, uh, what is being offered, what the events are, and, and what the uh, sign-up uh, uh, process is. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Yeah, I would love, you know, I'm not the cook in my house, but I would love I would love some skills, some skill development. And the fact that we have professional chefs, that's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. We did have one more question for you in the chat, Ms. Uh, Fitzhugh. And then I had a, I guess I wanted to ask Mr. Uh, Scoggins a few more questions, even based off mm -hmm. some of the information you shared with us. And so it was right. asked, um, what, I don't know, let me go back to what, hydroponics uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what are hope's plans for the hydroponic facility next door it looks exciting so are you well, aware um yeah so um what hope is uh doing now that we've uh, uh, uh been granted the contract uh with the city is uh they're working on the staffing right now um, there will be a project um, uh, director and uh, and uh, there will be staff uh, to actually, you know, to, to do the work uh, of that hydroponic center. Um, I don't know at this time um, what, um, what they're going to grow there. I know that in the past they've grown lettuce and I did not know until I saw it for myself, that lettuce is like a flower. It's actually beautiful. The, the way lettuce looks when it's grown uh, is it's really magnificent. Um, unfortunately, Goler did not do well with the staffing and running uh, the, the project. Um, and, and so, one of the, the reservations that, that Hope had was we did not want to make the same mistakes. We wanted to make sure that we brought in people who are experts in this field and they know how to do it. Um, and, and so that, that's what uh, we, uh, is going to be happening. But what it's also going to do is it's going to allow um, us to be able to grow the fresh produce that we want to be able to give away. I, I, some of you may know, but the, uh, the food bank, um, because of just cost of living inflation and uh, COVID and storms and you name it, but the food bank uh, has been having difficulty really acquiring sufficient produce. Uh, for all of the, you know, the food pantries and, and food programs uh, in, in the uh, city and in Forsyth County. So the, uh, the hydroponics is going to be a way where we can be a little more self-sufficient. Did yes, I answer the question? A hundred percent. And you ended it the way we needed to because you talked about self-sufficiency and that's the part of food sovereignty, growing things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I can imagine just speaking lastly to that point, the more people who start gardens, if we have things mm -hmm. like frost or anything, I know um, 
you know, there was a big demand for, for tomatoes, according to a lot of people who uh, I know who sell food, sell food last year. Well, sometimes this person didn't have any success and this person did. So, you know, the more people who become more aware of gardening, the more well, potential I got, we have. Well, I got to tell you, for, for Hope, um, it's been the um not just the community gardeners but it's been the individuals who have gardens in their homes that have been wonderful they've donated so much uh to hope so any of the 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 over you know that they have they bring it to hope and allow us to give it out free uh so that's and and anyone who is a grower who's on this call and you know you you want to know what can I do with those extra tomatoes and cucumbers and squashes and whatnot? Please bring them to Hope. I promise you, we will uh, be good stewards and make sure that it gets out in into the community. Yes, ma'am. Well, with that, is there a? I know you guys have a store, and you mentioned that was Tuesdays, right? Yeah, it's Tuesdays. it's the Northwest uh, Community Market, right? The okay. neighborhood community market yes so uh -huh. growers able to i guess get any profit for bringing things in on that tuesday or is everything they bring no. volunteer based? yes um, everything that they bring is volunteer uh we have uh, hope has a, a contract with a couple of farms mm -hmm. that uh, uh we purchase from the farms just like the retailers do Yes, and um, and then we're able to sell uh, back to the community at again a fraction of the cost. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. I did want to ask uh, Matthew another question related to some of the information Miss uh, Fitzhugh shared with us. Thank you so much again, Miss Fitzhugh, for your okay. Time then I'm assigned. I'm, I'm just going to sign well, off at this. Does meeting, anyone so have okay. a question? Does anyone have any questions for Miss Fitzhugh? Boston Thurman Community Gardens, Hope. Yeah, thank you so much, Ms. Fitzia. Okay. Thank yeah. you. And be a kid, feed a kid. All right. May 4th. If you're interested, let me know. All right. And I'll, I'll you, get the flyer over to NBN. Please and thank you. So we can get that okay. out. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank, thank you so you. much, Ms. Fitzia. Bye bye. Have a wonderful day. So, Matthew, uh, Thank you again for everything. Uh, the she mentioned the, I guess the irrigation, and I know one of the things we spoke about last week. Many of our community members who start gardens, I said they get a plot of land. A plot of land is way over there. <laughs> the the watering becomes an issue. So. Um, what are some of the ways that uh, cooperative extension can help us with some of those measures? Well, I just ordered some hoses that are 100 foot and some little sprayers on the end, some grant money out from the Winston-Salem Foundation. Um, resources and things, I'm about to have to leave here in a minute and go get some dirt actually for Mary was one of the gardeners over at Neil Place who requested some and I ordered two pallets and already handed all that out. So I'm gonna go get some more here soon. But um, yeah, as far as water, water is a tricky business because um, you have to worry about the backflow. That's one of the things the city was worried about. They used to let people use hydrants and have hydrant access, but there's a worry with bacteria that gets into the hose that can like get into our water supply. We don't want that. So there has to be some safety things encouraged and you know, it can cost can vary wildly and getting it paid for by the city can be very difficult. They've done it a few times, but only in special circumstances. So I'm gonna contact your local representative and part of parks and recs and things like that, if it's city owned property or it's nearby, but it, it can be difficult is what I've, my understanding is getting access to the actual city water lines. Yes, sir, wow. But also, there are a lot of gardens already established that have land and are looking for people to work at, like Kimberly Park, um, the other one I think of is the Enterprise Center, the Simons Green Acres over off MLK. Yeah. They have about an acre and a half. They're looking for someone to use their greenhouse and grow out there either for profit or for donation. They have a small farmer's market. They're looking for someone to grow and sell out there discounted prices to the local community and things like that. So there are opportunities around. 
to get paired with one. If you're looking to be paired with a garden, please reach out to me. I will do my best to find you growing space. There are some that are more, you know, of course, aimed at certain neighborhoods and some of that are at schools. So, you know, that's background check and things like that. But there are opportunities to be had. Yes, sir. Wow. So, yeah, um, Miss Rita is the our resident leader for Southeast Winston-Salem. I know she works extensively with the uh, SICA. Cena, Cena. I get the two mixed up sometimes. Cena the South Southeast Neighborhood Association, and of course their house at the Simon Green Atkins or uh, the Enterprise Center. Um, I didn't know there was a farmers market there, so that's very valuable information to have. One of the things I was talking to a gardener today, and he he mentioned so two things. It helps with. Ms. Fitzy was saying, because he mentioned having a vast amount of produce and not being able to sell it, wanting to sell it, not being able to sell it. So I'm, I'm imagining the farmer's markets are good with that. He mentioned that um, the he was selling some of his produce to uh, Foothills, but they ended up contracting with bigger farms. And so that took him out of that market. But some things like that, I uh, guess uh, community members don't necessarily uh, become aware of. But uh, yeah, I did not know there was a farmer's market at Simon Atkins. There's an, there's a, the one on Liberty Street that the city has run. Um, they're moving to Tuesdays now during the summer. And then there's, of course, Cobblestone. I forget where that's at exactly. I've been out there a couple of times. I should know. And then there's also the one at the fairgrounds. Those yeah. are the only... Um, farmers markets that I know of that are currently active besides Simon G. Atkins. Um, another program I figure I should mention here, it's a very new, we just got a grant for it for a few years to run. Um, it's called the Wellness Produce Box Program that's aimed at recipients of SNAP and EBT and things to get the most out of their benefits and how to, part of it's gonna be cooking classes and wellness classes and things. So we're looking to you know get families signed up for that. And we're partnering with local growers here in Forsyth County to buy local foods to send home with them and show them how to prepare it and things. Um, and that's through Cooperative Extension? Yes, that is okay. a new program. Their first class will be soon. I, 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 that's where I disappeared to look for our new agent. He's only been here a couple of weeks, but his yes, program sir. is very new and they're looking for expand out of that. Um, we also do a lot of cooking classes here as well. And then sometimes around the city. Um, I know that. Yeah, uh, Virginia Lopez is the agent for that. I'll put their contact information below. Rhett, Kyle is the wellness produce box person. I'll drop their contact information in the chat. Um, so what else I was gonna say? So um, Angela asks uh, about rain, rainwater barrels and would this help? Do you guys uh, help resource those to communities? We do classes on how to like install them and things like that. They just had a couple as a part of Creek Week. I know the county said that they're on discount for a while. Um, right now through either the city or the county one. Um, so I don't know much a ton about it. I will say though, your chances of running your whole garden, especially if it's a big space off of just like a single rain barrel, you know, it, it's gonna be hard to do. Especially yeah. if you've got like a roof structure in place to get that square footage to funnel all that water down into mm -hmm. it but even then you know the rain varies so you may have to still bring in your water but it can help if you have a site that has that access i certainly would look into it okay yeah right now you got more <laughs> reasons too so you know, not not ideal for a cold weather garden for sure okay so if i guess it's still out there during the winter time they freeze is that what you're saying and they can bust yeah oh they can bust okay that's why a class on this not just installing them and understanding them becomes important. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Matthew. Okay. Um, and, and I realized you say you had to go. Does anyone have any more questions for Matthew? I appreciate so much of the time you gave us today, Matthew. And of course, you're, welcome, you're more than welcome to stay on. Uh, okay. Very valuable resource. I'll drop the my rest of my contact information and those other two agents 
at around food in the chat and uh, always feel free to contact us. We also have a main line where Derek can answer just any kind of basic garden questions that, you know, you don't need to refer directly to us. So please feel free to reach out. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. And I know um, in addition to that, Mr. Orlando Roberts is here. Uh, Mr. Roberts, I know, has been working with um, what is it, Uncle B's. Uncle B's Organic. Uncle B's Organics Growing. I don't know. The, the, help me out, Rob, Orlando. Yes, sir. Uncle B's Organic Farming, um, Black Farming. He's international. Um, actually, he was a big contributor in the farming bed and garden at Kimberly Park. He His equipment helped lay the foundation. Um, and not only that, but the S.G. Atkins um, farm as well. He's been helping and helping land the foundation and raising beds and tending actually both gardens. So his company is actually behind the production of both of those garden beds. Um, where he works with the children. Um, I know him personally from working with NCLCVF and Power the Vote. Um, so he always stresses how important food sustainability is and food sovereignty for us creating our own food. And mentioning him, he actually just started his own uh, nonprofit, which will be coming to you guys soon called uh, Seeds of Tomorrow. Um, he just got his uh, board finalized and all his paperwork and designation finalized. And so be looking out for that. Seeds of Tomorrow by Bazir Razak, Uncle B's Gardening will be coming soon. Yes, sir. Okay. Also, I wanted to bring full circle. Um, all the information is wonderful and good. I know we're talking about food sovereignty, um, but in, in situations where city council just passed the the uh on the agenda for the hope foundation and the funding that they got for their freezers um we're going to be having what well, power to vote nclcvf um will be having i want to say we're aiming for the last weekend of june we're going to be having a collaborative organizing event where i want all these organizations at the forefront to engage the communities and then speak on what you guys are doing a lot of people don't know about the cooking classes and the independent gardens that are offered or what it means to vote on these type of things to get these things passed through city council you know um and so i'm gonna um my organization will be working on an opportunity to bring all these other organizations impactful organizations in our community to the forefront to engage our community members so that they are aware of these things and the work that we are all doing. Therefore, when we do have an issue that comes up, we can all galvanize with one another and we all know what's going on. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Orlando. And so I know uh, Uncle B's also does a lot of work with the the farm or the garden that they have at uh, Ashley Academy. So um, yeah, it's very wonderful. We we do have we we have contact and we were we had uh, a couple of different gardeners, farmers, etc., who um, basically were uh, double booked for today, so they could not make it which is uh, wonderful. And uh, nonetheless, we were still able to have a very successful session. And I do think we will, this is a conversation that we absolutely have to uh, continue. So I learned so much, so much, so much today, yesterday, um, since we've been doing these sessions. And uh, yeah, they gotta continue. Orlando, we do have another question for you in the chat as well. Um, can you share with us the work you have been engaged with regarding food sovereignty? Any ideas on how community members can move in this direction? Yes. So um, directly where my office was, of course, my office was located for Power of the Vote and Power Up NC at the SG Atkins Center. So this is when I, and then of course, um, like I said, working personally with Mr. Bazir Razak and um, I talked about Ashley. I actually was in a program with another nonprofit um, called Uncle 
um, raise us up too. I'm sorry. Well, we was actually working independently with rising second and third graders who had uh, literacy issues at Ashley Elementary. That was my first interaction with their community garden. This was before I even began working with Mr. Razak. And um, then the actual garden that they have at S.C. Atkins has farmer's market every weekend. So, of course, with my office being located there, I would participate and go, you know, uh, help support that. The, the garden, the urban or the local garden there at S.G. Atkins as well. As far as frontline engaging the communities, our organization actually engaged community in democracy for all and power the vote which means we educate our community members on the importance of voting and try to align them with the resources of educating themselves on voting, which is why I was stating earlier, all of these issues and commitments and ideals that each independent organization owns, even all of you guys on this call, voting is very important in getting those ideas to the community and getting those ideas to the forefront to be voted on. So we have to be actively engaged. We have to attend the city council meeting to know what's on the agenda. We have to be in the know-how to see what's getting passed and where this money is going to within our communities. So that's where I come in, putting other organizations in contact with one another and getting us to the forefront to engage these community members so they are educated and uh, informed on what to vote on and what is going on in the community and where. Um, so that's how I got in, involved in food sovereignty with Uncle B's and Mr. Rizak, because he actually works on um, volunteer for Power Up before he came over to Power the Vote. And so he has shown me how to organize and how to network and get people together for the common cause of voting. But in his personal life, in his personal business, he uh, is passionate about farming and food sovereignty, which is how I got involved and engaged. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for that. And just to add on to exactly what you're saying, um, I thought it was uh, funny with um, Matthew and even Ms. Uh, Fitz, you mentioned the, the irrigation, but Matthew stated more plainly that uh, it becomes tricky. It's a thing that you have to reach out to your city council for. And so when we look at the idea of food sovereignty and politics, we might not think about the fact that uh, local government plays a role in that. I mean, obviously, yeah, but local government plays a role in that. If we can't get the, the specific type of watering systems to our communities, uh, if we got to worry about, I think um, we got an email in East Winston a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, last year, about the quality of once it's selling water. You know, the most non engaged or contentious political position in the city is like who is going to control the water I, I think I can't think of the exact name of it but I look at it every year like this person never ever campaigns like we don't know we don't think about them everybody want to be city council etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh that specific uh role is critical why like the thought to me is like it's always on the ballot so if this is on the ballot obviously it's important for something and most people never even talk about uh who was over it's like the watering systems for in our communities uh yeah and so miss travis had a question for me in the chat which i love what is the difference between food sovereignty and food security um, food security is having access and having secure access to food. For instance, if you can afford to go to the grocery store and to drive the, to the grocery store and get anything you need, even have it over a period of time and you bought it, wonderful. You are food secure. Many of us might be food secure, but many of us, for instance, on this call, could say we're food secure, but not food sovereign. And so if you have to depend on yourself to provide food, right? Or your community to provide food. If your community can't go to the grocery store, if something happens and the food is not available at the grocery store, who, who do you depend on then? And so when you have to depend on yourself and you are able to and do 
in any ways, community gardens, personal gardens, depend on yourself for your food, the growth or the uh, husbandry, animal husbandry of your food, then you are food sovereign. You are not, sovereign is non-dependence on others. Secure is you can depend on them, but you're gonna get yours. So in a world where we can't necessarily guarantee we're gonna be able to get food from other people, it's vital that we also become food sovereign. And that also includes more food education as well. That's a wonderful question, Ms. Travick. Thank you for that. And so Christian asked to that, uh, food sovereignty is a food system in which the people who produce, distribute, and consume food also control the mechanisms and policies of food production and distribution. This starts, this starts in contrast, this stands in contrast to the present corporate food regime in which corporations and market institutions control the global food system. Basically, people themselves having direct control over the food they eat, where it comes from, and how it's shared with others. Or at least that's what I got. That's Christy. And so I think that brings us full circle back to the topic at hand, food sovereignty, local problems, local solutions. And so with both, with many of the people who spoke today and anyone who cares to share thought, feel free. This is about our communities being in, by definition, food deserts, having access, but the biggest issue not necessarily being that we are in deserts, it's more so being that we aren't necessarily food sovereign. And I think even if you don't grow or garden yourself, becoming way more aware of food becomes critical in this time. SNAP benefits leaving way more knowledgeable about food, how it's grown, how to properly cook it. You know, many of us grew up on microwave books. I told you, hey, ramen, Chef Boyardee, and even learning how to fish. We got a, a, a master fisher among us guys. Oh yeah, and with that point being made, uh, I want to introduce to the community, if you're not, if you have, well, I want to introduce to the community, many of you have not and have met our new impact and engagement coordinator, Mr. Dustin Sellers. Dustin hails from us. Of course, you see the shirt, Winston-Salem State. So he's an illustrious Winston-Salem State graduate, as is myself. Um, but one of the things he shared with us is his love to fish, which is a part of food sovereignty. So uh, I'm going to just allow Dustin to unmute, introduce himself to the organizer circle, his very first one, y'all. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all are going to be well. My name is Dr. Sellers. Um, and I'm here, um, Mr. Sadie. I am um, a Winston State alumni, and I also am from uh, Anson County, Waysboro, North Carolina. So I am a um, native of Anson County, um, which is a Title One economically deprived district. Um, a lot of things that I see here in Winston is very similar to the things that I see at, back at home. Um, it's that we just, you know, there's a lot of things that we, we don't have. We don't even have a Walmart, right? So we don't have a Walmart. So in a lot of places, it's very hard for a lot of individuals to get uh, quality food or even quality um, care for their medicine or access to their medicine and things of that nature. But um, it is a blessing just to be here and to be amongst you all. Um, thank you for allowing me to, um, be within this meeting with you all and um this topic of food sovereignty is something that uh stands dear to me as my major at uh winston state was health and exercise science so um i am very very in contact and aware of food sovereignty and food desert within um forsyth county and within also Anson county as well but thank you for the introduction as well mr taylor A good guy right there, y'all. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, Ms. Travick had another question for us in the chat. And Ms. Ms. Travick, feel free to unmute, ask your question. You're here. Feel like I'm back I'm in the classroom. Waiting, I'm just sitting back waiting for my grandson listening. I learned so much, and I just like to all that Diane had given us. And uh, 
Matthew, Matthew Scoggins from the Corporate Extension who helps me with our newly founded um, community garden, which is a massive one. So we're looking forward to good things for that one. But just listening now instead of talking uh, is good for me because I'm taking in a lot of making, I'm taking notes. Yes, but sir. as we talk about food sovereignty, I'm just thinking about my mind is coming to other questions about it. When we talk about food sovereignty, then I, talk about, then I thought about food security, what's the difference? And I thought about sovereignty then what about the corporate regime? What do they fit in? You know, it's just things just spinning. So I'm just going to get off and let you answer my question and just listen some more and learn. Yes, So ma'am. thank you for acknowledging that. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Well, the thing is, when you look around the country, around the world, a lot of people are, if they haven't been historically more so now, champion local, champion your local producers, local growers, et cetera, starting there. Why? Because corporations don't always care about people. They don't care about our health necessarily. And so if we say we don't want genetically modified food, well, we don't want genetically modified food. But if it's the easiest way for them to keep costs down, for them to spray it and keep bugs off of it, it's like, okay, well, Based off a definition of harm, if they don't have to prescribe to certain legal standards, whatever they can get away with, going back politically, then they're going to get away with, it, especially if it helps them keep costs down. So um, with that, when people take more control of their own food destiny, just like our destinies in all areas of life, but right now we start with food, then we take control out of the hands of the corporations. And so when we when we like real estate markets and different markets, period, markets, 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 markets like to use terms like buyer's market, seller's market. And so, Ms. Travis then uh, fell off. In in a world where we are a we 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 we're in a capitalistic society, Ms. Travick. And so with that, if we're we're capitalistic in this buyers versus sellers market, once our ability to grow food, our desire to grow food, our understanding and knowledge of growing food, or even farming or fishing for our food, producing and providing our own food is taken out of your hand and it's kept out of your hand. Well, that means that we are still beings that got to eat last time we all checked. And so with that, the corporations control and they become, we become dependent on them, completely 100% dependent on them. So even if we want food to taste differently, even if we don't want high fructose corn syrup in our produce or, or in our products, or we don't want genetically modified food, or we don't want food sprayed. We want watermelons with seeds. Well, this all the watermelon I got because they grew them and they grew them their way. And we had to depend on them to get them that way. So it's like, okay, you're going to take this or you're going to starve. When you have to completely depend on corporations. And so Hey, you know, um, Miss, uh, Miss, uh, what's her name earlier last time, Miss Angela Levine, she shared a lot of resources with us. Some that I did see, some that I didn't about, um, like we watch, if you haven't, there's a documentary, Netflix can become your best friend in this area, right? There's a documentary called What the Health. That, that's how a lot of people got started. What the Health, I'm right in the chat. Um, and talking about some of the things they highlight and what the health is, American, uh, maybe obesity, of course, genetically mod, uh, foods, health, heart, the American Heart Association being funded by Tyson's and different food companies. And it's like, hold up, that don't make sense. Yeah, because the people who sell you the food that 
leads to the worst conditions are also funding the food companies. So they're not going to make it a point to get you off of these things. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what's happening. What the health goes deeply into that as well. Um, in addition to that, uh, what's Seaspiracy. <laughs> Seaspiracy. If y'all haven't seen Seaspiracy, and, and listen, as a teacher, I had students who watched some of these documentaries and they came to me like, Mr. Taylor, yeah, I think I want to be, I could, I could like bomb the spell of conspiracy, but sea spiracy, it's like conspiracy with C in front of it. It's about the fishing industry, the, the, watch it. It, it made me watch it. Um, in addition to that, uh, Miss Miss uh, Levon, she shared a couple with us uh, last two weeks ago. Wake Forest just had an event last Friday, and uh, it was all Friday long. We had uh, Mrs. Uh, when Kristen was on, and she spoke about uh, but she went there and she she went to a couple of panels. I was not able to make it, and I really wanted to be there. But one of the keynote speakers at the end were two women who uh, were featured on a Netflix documentary called uh, Eye on the Hog. I'll put that in the chat. Eye on the Hog. And with Eye on the Hog, it goes through different African-American communities looking at the history of our food. And, I didn't fully watch it yet. My wife did. I believe it's tied to slavery. I think so, but I didn't watch it yet. So I, I don't know for sure. But you you also start to look at our historical food practices as people, especially considering it was dependent on different groups. You know, what was the natural food sources of African Americans before enslavement? Uh so that's not necessarily a question we ask ourselves. We grow up loving soul food, right? But, but is this the healthiest thing for us? And many times we find the answer is no. Some of that stuff is hard to get rid of though. And this is what my grandma did. And so part of it is continuously just learning more about food. And the, the stuff that we were provided, unfortunately, during enslavement was easy to produce and it was cheap. And so if you're talking about providing food for people you don't care about, are you trying to give them the absolute best food or are you just trying to do enough for them to keep them sustained, to continue to do the job that you do? Slavery was a corporation. The food they gave the enslaved was incorporated food. And so the same thing happens when we talk about the industry overall. Yeah, I mean, okay. So a couple of more comments from the chat. Uh, Kristen mentioned before she was uh, kicked off. This is why learning about community garments or farmers markets is important. We can shift the power to ourselves rather than corporations. Also, garden is fun too. And uh, Mr. Orlando Roberts, this is a question for you. Can you put your information in the chat, please? And Ms. Travick gave me some clarity. High on the hog traces the origins of African American cuisine, tracing it through lines from Africa to Texas. Yes, man. Thank you for that, Ms. Travick. A um, couple last points as we get to wind down. If anyone wants to share anything, feel free. Um, okay. Yeah, I think we overall had a wonderful session and um, as we continue to matriculate. Last the last couple of years, my family have planted a couple of fruit trees. Uh, we'll see what happens with those. I got three peach, two apple. Um, the 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 gardener in my community today was telling me he was having issues with. First of all, his tillers broke, so he hasn't been able to get started yet. And with that, he's looking for someone. The person who was supposed to come till hasn't been available. So you're either looking for somebody else to come till. But I mentioned to him 
getting the tillers fixed and uh even hey grassroots grant for that i don't know i don't know i don't know we'll we'll as we know in nbn find out more about the program the program the qualifications etc but if you can my question to him is okay well if you get a grant to get your tillers fixed will you be willing to help till other people's lands also and his answer was an absolute yes and so he mentioned that he had been doing that already. And so um, I think that's the type of thing that um, we want to get to. It's a lot of information, like Miss Rita told us last meeting, how wonderful she was doing with her garden. And like as I mentioned, Miss Rita has the green thumb. We know Miss Sandra has the green thumb. We know Miss Travick has the green thumb. And my thumb's brown, but you know mm -hmm. I, I'm here to learn for y'all. They can be green too. Uh, yeah, we we got a small garden, and the more I'm learning, and the, the more these prices go up, I'll be I'll be in the yard. I'll be in the yard. I'll be in the yard. We 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 can do some more stuff. We we, yeah. All right. So uh, I know we got Miss Nakia Ingram uh, here with us from Care of Violence. I don't know if Miss. She is able to unmute to possibly introduce herself to. How are you doing, Ms. Ingram? Hi, how are you? Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. All right, you're welcome. Um, I'm Nakia Ingram. I am the new Cure Violence Program Manager here at um, well with NBN. And it was nice being on this call and listening to all the great um, resources that we have out here for our foods and for as food sovereignty in our community. So it was a great honor of being on this call today. Um, I have been on a couple of the full circle calls um, in the previous years, but this one was really good because I didn't even know we had these type of resources here in, in our community. So it was great. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Thank you. Thank so, you. Some more things to bring to the different areas as we try to solve many problems in our community. Yes, yes, yes. Thank Miss um, Crystal Dixon just left. Man, I was going to try to, I know she has a class coming up at two. I was going to try to ask her to uh, introduce herself. But she she joined us in from Wake Forest. Also a wonderful resource over there. Um, but no further ado, if anyone has any more questions or comments about the Organized Circle, please feel free to uh, let us know. M. Schwartz, Mr. Bob Schwartz, starting the first school food pantry. I would be happy to share our experience. Please, Mr. Uh, Bob Schwartz, if you can, can I mute, let us know a little about yourself, share your information with us, please, sir. Are you able to unmute, Mr. Schwartz? I think it's gone, Chris. I don't see him connected still with us. Okay. Yeah. And I think uh, even when you or Kristen left, somebody texted me and they were still on the screen, but then they were not. I mean, eventually they popped off. So I think. I'm getting everything later also, because I still see him right here, but he could be gone. But nonetheless, uh, so much information, so much information, so much wonderful information. I do think we're going to have to do a part three of this. We're going to have to do a part three. We probably won't do that next, but maybe. I mean, we're going into April, and in April we were thinking of, uh, well, I know we're going to do environmental justice in April, especially with a lot of the stuff we got going on. Um, but we'll see. Maybe we got to come back to it in June or May. But I, we, we got to stay connected. And I do think that thought that we threw around about the Food Sovereignty Code Collective, it, I mean, what I'm finding, we had uh, Reverend Bass, who wasn't able to join us today because he he had another engagement. He wanted to be here. 
but there are organizations who are collectively working together, as we've learned from Cooperative Extension, as we've seen what uh, Boston Thurman is doing with HOPE, and even some of the things HOPE do. So we found ways if we overproduce and we want to give away produce, we know where we could take it to HOPE. We know we got SG Atkins if we want to go sell. Does, did anybody catch the day that SG Atkins Farmers Market sales. Is that a Saturday thing, Mr. Roberts? Do you know? Um, Am I, can I get off? I'm off mute. Most of the time, it's um they do Saturday. I know that they do Saturday morning starting at nine a.m. Um, if they're still there, I, I haven't been there. My office is up for grabs, so I haven't been there in a few months, well, a couple mm -hmm. months. But while I was there, normally every Saturday around nine a.m., they had and they throw events too they have movie nights during the summer like they do a lot of things in that community garden at sg atkins yes sir Thank and you. when you do environmental justice you know that uh we're definitely on that us and power up yes sir absolutely yeah uh miss reed has you have you ever sold any, any of your produce at the uh farmer's market No, I just give it around in the neighborhood. That's yes, basically what I do. It's just the people in our neighborhood. We have large families. So I just take what I have and I take what we have for our family, freeze it and everything. But whatever is left, I just give it to the neighbors. Yes, ma'am. That's what I do. Absolutely. We also got to talk about canning. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I ain't going to hold y'all. Anybody? Last thoughts? I think this was a wonderful session. I learned so much today. Go ahead, that's I'm still asking for Mr. Roberts' information in the chat. I missed it. I was disconnected, so therefore I lost everything in the first chat when I came to reconnect. So if he could please just put his contact information in the chat for me, I appreciate it. Orlando Roberts, please. Um, I just have one thing to say. Okay, awesome. Pretty soon, um, we're going to be having a um a meeting at the Salt Box in relations to um the grassroots grants. So if anyone um is interested in actually um coming to that event, just shoot me an email, and then I will RSVP for that event, and I will send you more information on the date and the time of that event. But it will be in the beginning, the first month of uh the first week of April. So um everyone just keep that put that on your calendars and mark it for the first week of April and get in contact with me so we can get you some grant funding for these gardens. And that's all I have. I'm gonna visit you, Mr. Uh... <laughs> all right, General. Mr. Roberts, if you're still with us before we close out, could you share your contact information with us, Mrs. Travick? Is asking. I know I got your email. I do need your phone. Yes, I appreciate it very much. If not, then I'll just find it some of the way. Well, I, I can see. I can definitely send you his email. Okay, that'd be great. Ms. I just want to. Yeah, I want to connect with him for some some uh, profound reasons. Just enjoying yes, him talk. So it's in the chat now. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Right there, Get a chance to collect that. Just last, last comment. I'm going to tell you what was interesting to me. You know, back in the day, how our grandparents and great grandparents lived to be in their mid 80s to 90s. Mm -hmm. Everything they were eating, they were growing. Mm -hmm. Very rarely. I had a conversation with my son's great grandmother, who is 87 years old and can still walk around, drive herself, and is very capable. Back then, they did canning. They grew their own herbs and vegetables in their garden. The only reason why they most of the time would go to the grocery store is if they needed, you know, flour for baking or, you know, meat from the market. But other than that, they lived, they raised their own chickens. They grew their own vegetables. They grew their own herbs. They made their own salves. They lived off their land they that, they that they tended. And therefore, their lifespan was as it's supposed to be, which was just something that was very interesting to me. And that just brought me back when I heard, you know, even the 
the term food sovereignty. There was a time where we tended and tilled and lived off our own land. And that increased our lifespan because we wasn't being exposed to genetically modified um, produce and herbicides and pesticides and things like that. So um, it just kind of brought a different definition to food sovereignty to me. But that was it. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And right. Your information. I did not have your number. But to add on to what you're saying. One of the things we mentioned in our last organizer circle was uh, how therapeutic it is to garden, right? And so I, I, I realized one time I went to play golf. Like, Why are all these people play golf? This seems stupid. And then I understood being out there, how tranquil, you know, the focus. It was like meditating with your eyes open, you know what I'm saying? And then you're around green. So, you know, the trees, the grass, they help us. We, we release carbon dioxide, they release oxygen, we help each other, we feed each other. Uh, and I think air is food. Yeah. And so um, with that, I was pulling weeds in our little garden last year. And I remember I had an epiphany and there's something we talked about last year too. And it was just like, this is kind of like that time I played golf. It was just, you know, just of course the pollen. No, nah, but this is uh, later in the summer, so the pollen was gone. But you know, just being there, breathing in nature, working in nature, you know, that's a form of therapy. And so it it it's a it's a holistic benefit. You being a, a history teacher, for instance, teaching world history, one of the things I used to teach my students was uh about the time zones, not not the time zones, but the uh, basically the clock related to the sun. And so if we get in school around September and it's still kind of hot, eventually you have a jacket. One of the things I make a pay attention to is the, the sun, the times it rise, the times it fall. The sun, if you don't know, uh, like once we, right now, we get in a minute more of sunlight every day until the end of uh, August, August like 21st is when we have uh, the summer solstice. That's when it starts to reverse and you start to get a minute less of sunlight every day until the winter solstice. Winter solstice is December 20th, is it the 21st? I believe it's 21st. In addition to that, what we are coming into now is the spring equinox. In the spring and the fall, it's even, so it's the equinox. You you typically got that warm, cold feeling at both times. And so you, you typically got an even amount of sunlight and daylight as well. But with me teaching that to these students and it, it blowing their mind, part of it is because the amount of time we spend out time, outside, the relationship that we've grown or the disassociation that we have grown with nature has also become critical. Children don't go outside like they used to. I remember going home and Christmas and I'm like, everybody always came outside during Christmas. They don't go outside. I don't come outside on Christmas. Ride the bikes, but don't like this all what? Show your new clothes off. Y'all don't come outside on Christmas. If y'all come outside on Christmas, then y'all don't come outside. And so I think when we talk about a lot of the issues we're dealing with, about the cure of violence, mental health, the school systems, this plays a part in it. We, we have been disassociated from nature. And that's another reason why it's so vital for us to become not just food sovereign, but sovereign in different ways. But if you're not controlling even jobs, your, your schedule, your COVID exposed that, if you can't have a day to just take a break. If you don't have the time to work, you work all day, then you gotta go pick up your children. Then do X, Y, Z, then, then y'all go home, wake up and repeat. Do you have time to get in the garden? And so with that, we gotta create those spaces by go get in the group, get in the community club. If, if the elders in the community retire and they can do some of this stuff well how do we help you who are going to be able to do this stuff what little role can I play in just getting added to what y'all already do and how do we go from there 
And so Ms. Travick added, maybe we can discuss how Black farmers have come under attack by design and become extinct. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Uh, Mr. Vernon Johnson, I think that's his last name. I was I was with him Sunday, but I wanted to get him on. I contacted and communicated with a lot of people who just were not able to be here. Farmers, gardeners, et cetera. And so that's why I do think we are going to have to have a part three because the conversation from a lot of those master farmers, master gardeners who we got in the communities, a lot of what they shared in regards to not just their experiences, but the issues they see that relate to our community became vital. And so as Mr. Roberts spoke of earlier, many of these things that we say by design, they were political. And so everything uh, in the end of the day, every decision is an economic decision, which also means every decision can be tied to politics. I'm done. All right, gentlemen, ladies. With no further ado, I appreciate everyone, every last one of you for your time, your space, your attention today. I hope you, as did I, learned a lot, this organizing circle. Thank you. And join us again next time. Thank you, Chris. Goodbye to all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Good job. Have a great day. Have a good day. Absolutely. Yeah, have a wonderful day. Talk to you guys soon. Okay.